Hey guys, it is great to be back with you again. Another episode of Sob Talk Live. Mark Romisher and I are here almost every Thursday evening at eight <laughs> o'clock Eastern time, streaming live on Facebook and YouTube just for the Sob community. So glad that you're here. Everyone, welcome to the show. This week, we're going to be talking about current events and how they're mm -hmm. affecting gas prices and all the Saab owners out there trying to keep their Saabs on the road. Now, later in the show, we're going to be talking about um, how to get the most out of your Saab, especially in lieu of all these increasing gas prices. And after that, we're going to talk about how we can bring some of the goodies from the uh, Prancing Horse camp over to the Prancing Moose. Oh, yeah. Some uh, some cars you're really going to want to see. So stick around for that. OK, Mark. So, man, gas prices going crazy. And with yep. SOC coming up, you know, that's that's a factor. A lot of us are going to have to drive quite a ways. You've done a, a bit of math on all of this. And yep. so let's let's take a look at that for you, what it means for you. So just from my perspective, I'm, I will be traveling from Central Virginia and from Central Virginia to uh, Sturgis, South Dakota, we're looking at a, a distance of 1,733 miles, you know, rough, roughly right about there. Mm -hmm. And at that distance, and especially current today's gas prices, that's going to be a substantial um, expense. So I sent you a picture earlier, Lee, that kind of had a picture from a few days ago, but premium gas, which is what most Saab owners use, 467 or 468 a gallon, if you round up, yep. um, at that cost... Um, we're looking at, you know, um, we did the math with a round trip and even with driving around there, roughly about $800 or more in fuel expenses. And that's assuming everything goes perfect. Your gas mileage is consistent. And I wait, the way I calculated that is with uh, my nine five, um, and it gets about roughly 23 miles a gallon. That's going to fluctuate a little bit with high, highway miles, but mm -hmm. you know, around town and some distance, about 23 miles a gallon. So that would be a significant expense for anyone making that trip. And especially um, once you get there, um, there's going to be more driving, especially with uh, all the venues and yeah. activities to do, which are a little ways away. So definitely want to factor that into your um, plans. And so you're now... So you're talking about over 600 bucks round trip out of pocket for all that gasoline for you. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's basically what we will be looking at. Um, I, it'd be about, uh, I calculated about closer to 750 um, oh. with, with roughly the mileage mm -hmm. and the Phillips. Um, and that's assuming, um, and that's about 75 gallons of fuel used um, for just, you know, one way. So that's, yeah. you know, we got to think about that expense. It's become more and more prevalent. So yeah, the car's not going to you know, sit in the parking lot once you're there. I mean, there are a lot of drives and other things, activities you're going to go out and tour. So yeah, there's all of that. Now that's, you've calculated that on premium prices, right? Yes, I did. But you can, even though your car wants premium, mm -hmm. you can safely burn regular in these cars. Yes. Yeah, the management system of most of our SOBs will make do and make adjustments to the timing and the fuel, but also keep in mind that um, premium gas does also afford better gas mileage based on the way the engine management system, you know, affects how, you know, uh, the engine runs with mm -hmm. the lower quality gas. So that's a lot of factors in there. Now there's Saunders saying he's getting 28 miles a gallon in his version. So, yeah, you know, it's going to cost us all a little bit of money, but, you know... It's still worth it, right? But let's let's bounce out and talk a little bit about um, what goes on in our cars and what makes it safe to run a lower grade of gasoline. Let's jump out to uh, Wendell, North Dakota. North Dakota, sorry. North Carolina. <laughs> sorry about that. And Shane Mulcahy. Shane, good to see you again, bud. Hey, Shane. Good. How are you? So nothing wrong with burning. Even though it says use premium fuel, nothing wrong with using regular, right? That Saab was so smart in doing the things that they did that way. Yeah, no, nothing wrong with that at all. I think that was part of the appeal of the 93 Sport. Um, open the fuel door, and you can you see right there. There's a label. It says you can run 89, or what 87. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the engine will compensate. Premium, premium car without having having premium fuel in it. Now you uh, you're not going to get away with that uh, in some <laughs> of the cars that you just got worked on. Uh, for oh, example. No, no. You're just back from uh, you're just back from Ferrari land, right? Uh, this is you were fixing Ferraris for a while there. I was indeed. 
Um, so what I want to talk about tonight is kind of what you saw in these crazy cars uh, mm -hmm. that is still, uh, you see things are kind of like ours a little bit. There's some similarities there. Yeah, a few. <laughs> okay, so walk us through that. What's what's the same? What's there's a lot different. We'll talk about that. But what's the same? Um, I think a lot of it is uh, uh, sort of the niche of of the the way Swedish design or engineers built those cars versus the way the Italians do. Um, they like to do their their own thing. They're they're not particular to any conformity. That you know they don't they don't run the way of the Germans that are all the same or or you know our domestic stuff. Um, so they have their own features and characteristics that are, are just true to them, which is pretty neat to see. Yeah, one of the things that uh, you, we started talking about is uh, trying to manage heat loading in our engines. To mm -hmm. uh, So the higher the level of heat in the engine, the more likely you are to detonate and knock. And so you know, yep. that's one of the reasons that you want to try to manage heat because it produces more power. And you were saying that in the Ferraris, they've got all kinds of heat management technology. Oh, yeah. And I mean, uh, and it's it's anything from you know evacuating the heat from the engine bay through through ventilation or, or or you know ram forcing air into the engine bay and out um lots of heat shielding uh mm -hmm. anything from you know you you're looking at a picture of an f40 here so that's old school air to air intercoolers versus some of the newer ones use water to air intercoolers um anything to keep intake temperatures down and exhaust heat within the exhaust and expelling it from the car as quickly as possible. Yeah. Well, you've done some of that yourself in your car. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't look maybe quite as exotic as what we're seeing here, but tell us what you've done in, in your Saab. Yeah, and your Vigan <laughs> here. <laughs> yep. So that's um, <clears throat> a pretty popular method of heat management on exhaust components is using that uh, header it's known as header wrap um, the stuff i use in particular is made by a company called dei design engineering um, it's their titanium fiber wrap so it's relatively cheap you know you're talking 50 bucks for a 20 foot roll mm -hmm. um, and it's it serves its purpose you know it's cheap it lasts a reasonably amount reasonable amount of time um, but it's it's no motorsport grade heat shielding. And speaking of motorsport grade heat shielding, um, you mentioned before that um, you have a little project going on with some of your exhaust components. Can you go ahead and uh, give us some give us some information on that? Yeah, so I took my car apart and the uh, header wrap sort of just crumbled. Um, granted, it's, it's about five years old now. So mm -hmm. I was kind of expecting that for a, a fiber wrap that you know has been heat cycled a couple thousand times um so while i was at ferrari i was looking you know a lot, there's those are just race cars for the street and they use a lot of dimpled stainless heat shielding um and exactly like that that's by a company in uh indiana called header shield oh, and it's nice. it's dimpled heat shielding so it's the dimples allow um a larger surface area um that can absorb more heat. And then there's an inner layer of a, a high temperature resistant fiber, and then another layer of stainless on the inside. Um, and there's really nothing better than, you know, an air gap and uh, a metal heat shield uh, to keep heat in where it needs to be or keep heat away from other components. Uh, yeah. So that's sort of what I'm looking at having done to my hot side stuff while it's apart. Um, certainly Ferrari inspired, motorsport inspired, and it's very effective, but it's not necessarily cost effective compared to like a heat wrap or something. Mm -hmm. That's, that's pretty sexy looking stuff. So uh, here is, uh, here is Saunders asking, you know, you didn't have, he's saying you didn't have your charge pipe wrapped. Would that make a difference? Uh, yeah. I mean, same concept, you know, if, if you're trying to keep heat away from something, any form of heat shielding, whether it's a wrap or a ceramic coat, um, it works pretty effectively. But it, personally, in my experience, in, in this case, it's more important. It was more important to me to um, have the exhaust wrapped and then just have my uh, charge pipe painted just mm. for the look personally. Yeah. 
Well, that whole idea of uh, getting cooler intake temps, um, a lot mm -hmm. of guys are going to intercoolers. What are we looking at here? Uh, so that's the front end of my car. Um, same concept, you know, I'm just, I was just adding that, that black heat exchanger on the bottom right hand there. That's, um, I added an oil cooler in, in place of the stock one, uh, a little bit larger and I positioned it. So it's, uh, right behind the fog light duct and I removed my fog light and, mm -hmm. uh, I made a, a duct for it. So it's a, it should work a little more efficiently than the factory one. Um, I have a, I have some temperature probes. I've been using to record data. And once the thermostat opens and oil starts circulating through the oil cooler, it's much more effective than the factory one. Yeah, I'll bet that's true. Um, I want to get back to the Ferrari world for just a second and uh, walk us through some of the cars you were able to touch. Uh, what are we looking at here? So that is a 488 Pista, um, sort of the high performance race car inspired version of a regular 488 um you know more larger larger ducts better aerodynamics uh larger cooling package more power all the good stuff with those things incredibly fast vehicles and this thing is uh it's got a very mclaren look to it it does um don't 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 tell anyone i said that though they'll come after me <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, so that's a new SF90. Uh, that's the newest uh, hybrid um, mid, or rear engine or mid-engine supercar that that Ferraris put out. They're about a thousand horsepower. Um, those have a, a pretty incredible cooling package on them because now not only you're trying to cool a mid-engine twin turbo V8 that's hot and doesn't get great airflow, but you you also throw electric motors into the mix and it gets even hotter. Mm. So packaging is even tighter on something like that. How big of a check is Mark going to have to write to, uh, to, to buy that one? Oh God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think base price on the SF nineties is around 500,000 or so. And uh, that's with no options. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> options. Exactly. Exactly. And can you imagine the cost of driving? Well, no, see, Ferrari guys, though, they don't drive their cars, right? I mean, we talked about that no. a, a little bit ago. That's just, you just don't do that. It's um, the, the way the market has moved and, and Ferrari has done a really good job at, at uh, uh, transitioning the company into a new sort of buyer. Um, the old school stuff is a lot of like, you know, what we're used to with the Sobs. Like they're diehard car guys. They love driving the cars, maintaining yeah. them. Uh, the new ones are, they're just as finicky, but, you know, the modern buyer wants to get in their pretty red car and just drive it. Um, mm -hmm. And with the way the market fluctuates, a lot of people like to flip them. So most of them that came in were f less than 10,000 miles, a lot of them below 5,000. Uh, anything over 10,000 miles was considered high mileage. Wow. Half a million dollars to go out and pet it and look at it in the garage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. basically it was not uncommon to see cars that were three or four years old with 500 miles on them well when you wow. got to pull the engine to uh do as much as you know the engine out yeah. service service ticket what what's the right on that how much am i spending 25k to, for that kind of service just about on the old ones um the new ones you don't really see that because they're more modern they use timing chains and they're a little more they're much more reliable excuse me Mm -hmm. um, but for example, that old Testarossa had 2,500 miles on it. It's almost 40 years old now. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This car, for, this is the one that had 25,000 miles on it? 2,500. A oh, hundred. Yep. Wow. That's a 512M. Um, last year production of the Testarossa. So, um, electronic fuel inje injection, electronic ignition, very rare car. Uh, that one's a garage queen as you can kind of see. Yeah, uh, but you know, for for those you know doing timing belts on them, engine had to come out. Wow, that was an F forty wow. uh, that we purchased and sold. Uh huh. Did did timing belts on that one? It was kind of neat. Not kind of neat. It was very neat. That's just a race car. The street legal. Absolutely incredible. So I talked to a guy who uh, in retirement was. Um, working for a dealership and driving these cars to the owners who bought them. So a delivery driver. Mm -hmm. And he said, after an hour, you hate the thing. 
Did you? Did, oh yeah. Is that true? Is that, <laughs> has that been your experience? Um, I never drove any of them long enough to, to say I would be uncomfortable, but I mm -hmm. can certainly understand being in, in one of those for a long period of time would be uncomfortable. Um, Ferrari's whole mantra is, is driving experience, driving experience, driving experience. And, uh, that seems to come through engine performance and chassis stiffness, which in, in turn, you don't have NVH, like, you know, a typical car, um, mm -hmm. they're very hard. Uh, they ride a bit rough. Uh, you know, they're stiff, they're noisy, the engines, you know, six inches away from you. Uh, even even with modern, you know, NVH technology, they're still they're still very close to a race car, but they're for the street. NVH noise, vibration and harshness. Is that what you're saying? there? Yes, that's correct. OK, so let's get back to our sobs uh, and uh, we saw your wrap. What's uh, what's mm -hmm. something else should we be concentrating on, and why why is the whole header wrap thing so important? So with uh, any modern turbocharged engine, uh, you want to keep the heat in the exhaust pipes so that it can evacuate away from the car as quickly as possible. Because when we go up in horsepower, that's more energy, and the byproduct of energy is heat. So we want to take that heat and, and expel it from the vehicle as quickly as we can. Uh, because, you know, it gets hot under an engine bay. The, mm -hmm. the, the heat in an engine soaks intake temperatures. They go up and that decreases performance. Yeah. So and actually, I just wanted to bring it up, uh, Lee, if you don't mind. Um, you had been talking to us before the show and you mentioned you have your own project to get rid of heat and uh, you want me to remind you about it so uh why don't you tell us more about that lee if you, if you don't mind well it's a simple little uh process here let me stop this for a second um uh so what you're seeing here is my 900 and uh on the sitting there on top of it is uh one of the do 88 um front mounted intercoolers and off to the side there is the factory stock intercooler look at the difference in size <laughs> that's amazing Yes. You said it's a, what a quarter the size oh, of yeah. the original versus the, the the new replacement. Yeah, easily, easily, and you know what? I got to give a lot of credit to the Do 88 guys. So you have to cut off the uh, the towing eyes on the front of your car to do this, and then you know, drill a hole in the uh, uh, cross member there at the, in the front of the car, and that's it in terms of modifications. Pretty darn simple. And then um, this thing just kind of fits into place. They've done a great job engineering this kit. And um, so haven't, haven't got it finished yet. I got interrupted. And so I'll get back to it, hopefully get that done. And I'll post something about it on the YouTube channel when that day comes. But uh, so I, I don't expect that's going to make a huge difference. I get it. I'm reducing my inlet air, my intake uh, or charge air temperature by about 100 degrees, if I remember the, the spec sheet. Um, wow. <laughs> but you've done one, Mark. Did you feel a difference in your mm -hmm. car? Absolutely. So when I put in, uh, I put in a D O eighty eight aftermarket nine five uh, intercooler in my uh, two thousand five nine five arc, and I definitely felt a difference in. Uh, I guess I was going by a uh, uh, but dyno statistics, but uh, <laughs> I felt a difference as far as you know how the acceleration was. Um, I. I have been uh, looking at the statistics and there's more airflow through that intercooler versus factory. Um, it does a much better job because it's a lot thicker as far as cooling the air. So bringing down those intake air temperatures definitely increased uh, performance as far as across the spectrum. So yeah, you feel it in cold weather, but especially during um, the summer months, you don't lose uh, performance as much due to heat soak and that's very important when you're trying to keep uh, the intake uh, temperatures def definitely down as much as possible so if you're uh, uh, shane explain heat soak what uh, what's going on there and what's happening so modern engine management systems have safety parameters in set um so that your engine does not knock because we all know that's bad um and knock is induced by uh poor fuel quality um things getting hot in particular, your air, your charge air temperatures as it enters the engine. And that is what typically causes knock. So when you, when you change, you know, your intercooler out to a larger, larger one, um, and you effectively reduce the temperatures, what you're doing is you're 
you're prolonging that that range of um, performance that you have available uh, before the the engine management system sees you know hey the the temperature here is too high so we need to we need to kill power a little bit so it's safe to to continue running. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so the uh, I want to go back to something else that you're doing. You told me that you took apart um, a lot of your exhaust system, right? That's your exhaust. No, that's actually um, Paul Fecht. Uh Those oh, are okay. the, uh, that's the downpipe and the intake and charge pipes on his uh, uh, 2.8 V6. He's got a, a, an 06 93 Arrow. Um, and that's a ceramic coating, which is another really good option because, you know, you can put it on both exhaust parts as well as intake parts. And it, you know, it keeps the heat in and prevents it from radiating outward. Um, or vice versa, you know, it prevents radiating heat from getting into the pipe and affecting the temperature of whatever's within it. And another extreme modification is uh, happening here. What's going on with this car? Yep. So this is uh, Brent Yastrzemski's car. He's a, he's another Saab, Saab vegan modifier like myself. He's a little on the extreme side. And um, uh, he is taking the approach of, uh, I guess you'd call it heat evacuation, um, sort of the same way, you know, all those Ferraris have have ducts that run through um, the engine bay. The, the, the goal is to remove heat through ram air as, as most efficiently as you possibly can out of the engine bay, mm -hmm. um, which is another good, good way to remove it. Um, so he's, he's integrating a, a vent on his hood um, from a, a Mitsubishi Evo. And I believe Garrett Vanderputten is, is working on that for him. And that should be quite effective. Yeah, that'll be cool to see. Uh, I just saw a message there from um, uh, from Saunders asking about water and alcohol injection. Um, that seems uh, probably not something I'm going to do on my 900, but tell me more <laughs> about that. Another good option. There's so like, that's the beautiful thing with modifying cars is there's so many different ways to approach a problem and, and, and then at the end achieve the same result in different methods. Um, so water injection or meth injection, either way, is you're basically spraying um, atomized air or methanol into your air intake system to reduce charge air temperatures. Um, because you know, when you throw when you throw water over air, it has a cooling effect. Same thing with methanol. Um, it's one of the great benefits of using E85 as a fuel. Um, once it's atomized and, and air runs over it, it, it's got a cooling effect. Hmm. Got it. It's funny that uh, we also think about uh, those intake air temperatures being brought down by sprays. Of course, that's not too dissimilar from another popular modification, uh, nitrous oxide or NOS as mm -hmm. more, more commonly. So just kind of want to put that out there. Mm -hmm. That apparently seems to be yep. another popular mod out there to do. And that brings down air intake temperatures even more um, so that's another popular option for uh, car motors out there as well. Yeah. So uh, I want to try to wind us down here, Shane. You've got something going on, an event going on next week. You want to let the world know about? Tell us about it. Yeah, Alan Alan Holmes. For most of you that know him, he's hosting an event at Dominion Raceway in Virginia. Um, I believe it's. Lynchburg or, or up in Charlottesville. Um, I've never been, but uh, they're hosting sort of a track day event and a meet and greet. Uh, it's going to be the 19th, and I'm pretty positive the event starts at 11 or 11.30 a.m. So huh? I'm going to try and bring the 900 out there as long as it makes it that far. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? It should, right? Hey, and by the way, guys, if, uh, if you've got an event, a SOB-based event that you're organizing and you would like to let folks know about it, definitely uh, get in touch with us. Be happy to share some information about that and, and try to get more people out to your place. Well, Absolutely. guys, I found this real interesting. Anything you want to add, Mark, as we wrap things up? Um. I guess right now, um, everyone is kind of preparing for, uh, you know, Carlisle and SOC. So everyone wants to be trying to get their mods and projects done before then. Obviously, uh, everyone has their own uh, own projects going on. But I will say that uh, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone's projects as far as, uh, you know, installations of intercoolers and transformations over to uh, T5s and 
all kinds of fun things. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing everyone's projects for sure. All right. Well, Shane, so glad you joined us. Thanks for dropping by, sharing your experience, your expertise, and uh, the fun you had working on Ferraris. Um, Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, one last question about that. What did you notice that was the same? Were there any parts that were the same on the two cars? Oh, my gosh. It was really funny because the uh, the Ferrari Master Tech that I had been training with uh, thought I was crazy when I told him, but the, the ever so popular um electrical connectors that use the red sliding clip mm -hmm. ferraris use those and so do maseratis and it was one of the first things <laughs> i pointed out to him and he thought i was a lunatic for thinking of sobs <laughs> anything close to a ferrari <laughs> awesome so glad that's great all right buddy we'll see you later thanks sean shane thanks for having thanks, me. Shane. all right that is uh shane Mulcahy from superior performance in wendell north carolina Mark, I can't wait to get out in the shop. Hopefully get that little project wrapped up and then we'll see what comes next. Anything working in your garage on your cars? You know, right now I am not doing anything fun or exciting, but I'm just doing regular maintenance. Um, I did have an oil leak pop up. I got to take care of in uh, my uh, convertible and, uh, you know, I got to keep a couple other cars uh, maintained. So there's always that. But, uh, you know, little things always come up. You always get a sensor here or a leak there. You always have to address and that's what uh, some people might say that is the charm of these cars. There's always a little, little something to go ahead and take a look at. But, you know, that's I think that's any car out, out on the road that you're trying to keep on the road. You, little things you always want to take care of. So obviously the important things you want to address further. But, uh, you know, there's always a little something that everyone needs to address. Something <laughs> almost always broken, right? That's, <laughs> that's yep. why we love them. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, next week on the program, we're going to be talking to a gentleman from Tennessee who is the owner and a Saab mechanic at Moose Proof Motors. So I hope you come by for that. And uh, we'll see you next week right here on Saab Talk Live. Take care. Have a great week, everyone. Mm -hmm.